Fact number one, transgender is not a disease. This is not my opinion. This is facts from the World Health Organization and the Amer American Psychology Association. Just like don't, gay people don't have a disease. Fact number two, it's not rich beautiful. kids stay rich, poor kids stay poor. It's not out of one, out of 1,800 billionaires in the world, 12 of them are black. Where you come from, where you grow up, how much your parents earn, whether your parents are were married plays a major role in determining yeah, I know where it's, your is there a life mark at the end. Fact number three, I would just like to remind you that hate speech is not free speech. Yes, it is. And my and question is, is, since facts don't care about your feelings, why did you use false facts? Okay, so none of the facts that I used are false. First of all, yes. Uh, uh, no, okay, first of all, uh, would you like the answer? Okay, so the, first, so the three facts you mentioned, you talked about transgenderism. First of all, until five minutes ago, the DSM specifically defined transgenderism as a disorder. It defined it as gender identity disorder, now it calls it gender dysmorphia, which doesn't even make sense. It says that depression is the actual problem, not the actual gender disorder, which again does not explain why the transgender suicide rate is upward of 40%, and the actual suicide rate for the rest of the American population is lower than 3%. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, you talked about income inequality, and you suggested that all wealth is inherited. This is nonsense. According to, according to the IRS statistics, if you are born into the bottom 20% of wage earners in the United States, you will not be one of the bottom 20% of wage earners in the United States. 90% of people will not be within 15 years. There's tremendous wage mobility in the United States of America. Plus, there is not a group of people who just sit at the very top and stay there. People move up and down, in and out of the 1%. 1% just defines the line of income it doesn't define the people who are in that 1% of income. I've been in the 1%, I've been out of the 1%. It will happen to lots of people. People who are older tend to be more likely to be in the 1%. They weren't once in the 1%. What happened? Okay, so that's number two. Number three, you say hate speech is not free speech. It depends how you define hate speech. The only speech that is not free speech is speech that overtly defends or pushes violence. Specifically, speech that is, that is generating violence, right? That's the only type of speech that's not hate speech. If I say things you don't like, that's not hate speech. And if you think that, that it is hate speech, you're a fascist. End of story. So what is your formal education background? Because uh, I guess uh, a lot of people don't know what your undergraduate degree is in. Uh, so I was at uh, UCLA in political science and then uh, Harvard Law School. Okay. Uh, so you don't have, uh, you wouldn't consider yourself an expert in sociology? Uh, I mean, I don't consider sociology a particularly expert field, but go ahead. <laughs> I think I'm able to read a sociological study. So you're not necessarily an expert. Yes, there are lots, there are lots of fields of study. Right. <laughs> well, what I'm getting at is there's a lot of topics. I, this way, I know a lot less about welding than I do about sociology. <laughs> uh, what I'm getting at is that you're not considered an expert in sociology, psychology, uh, gender studies, lesbian dance theory, uh, many of these things that you've brought up tonight. Uh, yeah. I know a lot more about all those others than lesbian dance theory. As far as, if you want to take issue with the argument, I would urge you not to use the argument from authority, which is somebody has a PhD by their name, they know what they're talking about. That's a dumb argument. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is that the fact that if you have any other further education on any of these topics or any of these fields of study. I don't need, to, I don't need a, a seven-year degree in sociology, no bullshit when I hear it. And granted, that's your opinion. Uh, right. Because I'm here, yeah, giving it. <laughs> that would mean that uh, you're also offering kind of an unqualified opinion on a lot of these topics. See, again, you're just making the argument from authority. I don't think slapping a PhD from Ferris State next to your name makes you an expert in all things in the field in which you propose to speak. Okay, the fact is that either my argument's good or my argument's bad. Citing to my credentials is a really bad way of making an argument. It's, like the, it's actually the equivalent of, it's so funny, when people do this, it's the equivalent of actually a religious person saying, citing to the Bible for an argument. I'm a very religious person, right? I mean, see this? It's the yarmulke, okay? I'm a religious person, okay? I never cite to the Bible. The reason I don't cite to the Bible is because that's an argument from authority, okay? You may not believe the authority to which I'm citing. I don't believe the authority to which you're citing. So you're going to have to make me an argument as to what I'm saying that's wrong instead of just saying I don't have the properly enumerated degree from the institution of your choice. I'm merely citing academia. I, if you haven't done any significant study or any type of educational uh, you haven't you know, established yourself as a PhD or a doctor in any of these programs, so how can you make a, a qualified opinion on any of these topics is my question. Because I have read the studies and I can have an opinion on them. 
So you mentioned how people aren't victims of, cir of circumstance. And As a general rule, some people are, obviously. But um, how do you explain people who aren't given access to certain things and stuff and therefore cannot advance? Like, you cite like single mothers and stuff like that and fathers leaving them. Mm -hmm. And women, oftentimes, you see it all across the country, Planned Parenthood clinics being closed down and stuff, and they can't get access to contraceptives or abortion and stuff that would stop them from being in that situation. But you think that somehow they should just help themselves, but when, in fact, kind of about 35 cents, I think they can help themselves. <laughs> I mean, that's the, the, the idea that, that contraceptives are not available in the United States is absurd. It's absurd, I'm sorry, it's crazy. The idea that you can't get, that you can't get cheap or free condoms anywhere. <laughs> I don't think that killing babies is the solution to you making bad sexual decisions. End of story. I mean, I don't think that, I, I don't see why, you know, the, the unsuccessful decision that you made was the decision to have sex out of wedlock and then get pregnant out of wedlock. That decision is not alleviated by killing so, the problem. So since you're going to say mothers are forced to be um, parents, should you then also incite like laws or something like that? Since you're going to force these women to be parents, that force men to be fathers? Well, and there already are. Them, it's, called, it's called paternity they're, they're tests. They're not fathers because they walk out and leave their kids and then you have this, as you said, Yes, absolutely. I'm in favor of that. It's called marriage and the left undermined it. It was off. <laughs> marriage was the greatest boon to women of all time, and then feminism came along and said women need men like fish need a bicycle, and it turns out that women need men like women need men. That's because we live in a society that's set up so women can't get as far as women. No, it's because God created wounds. So women should just, you know, say suck it and have a child, suck it up and have a child? Well, if you get pregnant, yes, because you don't get to kill things just because it's in your uterus. It's my body, how about you just stay out of it? How about you stay out of it? How about you just talking so much about how... I don't care about your appendix. <laughs> right, I don't care about your thorax. I don't even care about your uterus. I care about what's in it. And I take out my appendix, but I don't want it. So why can't I take out other parts of my body? Because they're not independent living human beings. They're not independent living human beings when they're a bundle of cells. Oh, okay. So, so let me get this. What, so, okay. Let's let's assume that you are that your scientific knowledge is vast. Let's assume your scientific knowledge. So, are you also against partial birth abortion? I think if like I don't understand why people would not abort like. I'm not you, at what point do you, at what point does that bundle of cells become a human being in your view? Um sorry. No really, I mean this is No, this I, is I just question. need to calm down for a <laughs> Sorry, did I turn you? No, I mean, the, 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 it's, it, that is a relevant question. If your argument is that it's a bundle of cells, then the question becomes well, why it's not a bundle of cells. Like, like, unless it's a threat to the mother, they form maternal abortion, it doesn't happen. But if it's a threat to the mother's health, or the mother, like, I don't see why he would force a living human being to give birth to that. Because it's another living human so being. So you're going to kill the mother to save the baby? And no, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're talking about a case where the mother's life is in danger. I don't know what you're talking about. Care and stuff after they're born. I agree with you that, that, that abortion is an exception when the, wife's, when the mother's life is in danger. But the concept of bodily autonomy means that I don't have to give up any part of my body unless the baby, I say so. The baby is not part of your body. The baby Definitely is a baby. Nurture it. Really, my wife is pregnant right now, and she's 30 weeks pregnant. Yeah. And 30, actually, 32. That baby is kicking the living crap out of her. Okay, that is a living human being in there. Okay, and I promise you that it is not a bundle of cells. I can guarantee you it's not a bundle of cells because that is a baby. Okay, and, 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 and I'm sorry, but you're technically a bundle of cells, but right? <laughs> We have all the questions that need to be asked. We have 10 minutes. We've gone all down this, but here's the, here's the final point. This, abortion is a very simple issue. If you believe, as you do apparently, that that's nothing in there but just a bunch of goo, then you're right. If you believe in something called science, that that is more than a bundle of goo, then you do not get to kill it just because it's convenient to you. And let me tell you something. No, science definitely dictates that a fetus, until it can leave the womb and be technically viable, is what is it? a bundle of cells inside of a person. Okay, so if you so if you can only live on life support, you're not a person. You stop being a person. So if you so if, I, so if you get in a car crash today, you put on life support, you're on an iron lung. You take out the iron lung, you're gonna die. You're not a person anymore. Is that how it works? 
if my brain is no longer functioning? No, if your brain is functioning, but you can't breathe on your own. Then I'm still technically viable. Brain function. No, you're not, because the machine is keeping you alive. Look, if, again, the bottom line is this. If you are defining whether something is a life or not based on your own convenience, that is the nature of evil. Okay, defining what a human being or not, whether something is a human being or not, based on whether you want it or not, is nasty. Did you manipulate science to enhance your own You're the one manipulating science. science. You're the one suggesting that it's, a, that, it's a, that it's like snot. You okay, it's not like snot. The DSM is highly politicized and has been for decades. It's and it was in, until two years ago, it was, it was classified as gender, dis, gender identity disorder of mental illness. Okay, we can move on to questions. Yeah, because you just don't like what we're saying. No, see, the difference is I let you talk. No, but let's go. You actually know my father, but you've had positive conversations with him, and you shut him down too. In what way have I shut you down? You've been talking for like 10 minutes here. <laughs> No, I, I did. You just don't like the answer. And I'm sorry if you don't like the answer. But not. As far as the institutional racism, all I would ask you to consider, you can believe what you want, but I would ask you to consider this. Shouting institutional racism does not actually combat racism. You have to find individual instances and you have to show me who the racists are so that we can fight them together. I hate racism. I think it's evil. But if you're just going to say institutional racism every time something bad happens, there's no way to fight it. I need a policy that you're proposing, or I need a person who's actually racist so that we can fight it together, or we can determine whether the policy is good. What I find, what I find really problematic is, is the, the virtue signaling that I see by so many people on the other side, which is, I don't have to give you the racist, I don't have to tell you who he is or what measures I'm proposing. I just say institutional racism, everybody cheers for me because that's an approved point of view, and now we move on with our lives. You haven't helped anybody, you've just made yourself feel better. Yeah, it's really, yeah, have yeah, her respond, please. Um, well, I think that uh, just um, institutional racism in and of itself, uh, first of all, I would say that the majority of the people that um, do bring up institutional racism do also have solutions as to how to combat it. Um, but Which invariably it, involve encroaching on other people's liberty, but yes. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I, would, I would just say that um, there is kind of, you, again, I feel like you're painting um, a, a wide and diverse group of people with the same brush and saying that uh, if you can't point to um, a policy or if you can't point to a person, then uh, you know you're just wasting everyone's time, and I think that a lot of people are trying to point to policies. And while and like, I, I think, think I think that the idea of pointing to a racist person mm -hmm. is fundamentally in contrast with the idea of institutional racism, because institutional racism grapples with um, implicit bias in the society as a whole, or not like yeah, not like a ghost unless, in the machine, right, unless, but unless in individuals. Unless you're connecting that to a policy to cop out, because now we're ghost hunting again. If you, if, I, if you just said to me, we have a problem in American society, income inequality, right, is a problem in American society. If you just gave me any problem, and I said, well, that's, this, that's the Bilderbergs' fault, right? That's the fault of the Bilderbergs, right? It's just, it's a conspiracy, it's the fault of the Bilderbergs, right? This is, this, there are all these conspiracy theories about the Bilderberg group. Now, let's say that they, they, it's the Bilderbergs' fault, or it's the protocols with the elders of Zion. It's whatever it is, there's some conspiracy out there. You would say to me, that's not useful because how, what, what are you even talking about? When you say institutional racism, it's too broad. You at least have to name me the institution. Which one is the racist one? Which institution is racist? Tell me which, like, so we can fight it, seriously. So we can fight it together. Just shouting slogans like institutional racism is not, it's not effective. Shouting white privilege is not effective. I want to be on your side. I do. I want to fight racist. I think race, again, I think racism is, I think racist, racist behavior is evil. I want to fight it with you, but I can't fight it if you're not if you're not showing me what it is. And we have to decide together if the policies you're proposing will alleviate racism or exacerbate racism. And it turns out I think that a lot of the policies proposed by the left, I think institutional racism is a way is is usually a lever for proposing a policy that is actually unpalatable to freedom, and then in, and then and then castigating people on the other side of that policy as being in league with the institutional racism. The policies are good or bad without regard to words like institutional racism. Is what I'm saying. I wish, I, honestly, I would love to sit down and talk with you for an hour about it because it's because it's a worthwhile conversation, and I think we could actually get somewhere with it. But I think that slogans generally tend not to be particularly effective in getting us to solutions. So, how do you say that some people don't have privilege when you basically just said that trans people aren't valid? They're not a thing. They're just girls pretending to be boys or boys pretending to be girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, okay. I
Oh, so everyone's excited. Okay. I also know, but gender is a completely different thing. No, gender is not disconnected from sex. So. It's not completely disconnected, but it's still a cultural thing. It's still from society. It's still okay. In the mind. No, it is not in the mind. Okay, you're not a man if you think you're a man. And I didn't say pretending, or if I did, I shouldn't have said pretending. Let me amend. Said playing. Okay, I said a boy who thinks he's a girl. That's the usual phraseology I use. Not playing. I usually say a boy who thinks he's a girl or a girl who thinks he's a boy, which is technically what we're talking about here. As far as the actual psychological issues at play, it used to be called gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder. Now they call it gender dysphoria. The idea that, that sex or gender are malleable is not true. Okay, and I'm not denying your humanity if you are a transgender person. I am saying that you are not the sex to which you claim to be. You're still a human being, and you're a human being with an issue that I'm, you know, I wish you Godspeed in, in dealing with in whatever way you see fit. But if you are going to dictate to me that I'm supposed to pretend, I'm supposed to pretend that men are women and women are men, no. My answer is no. I'm not going to, I'm not going to modify basic biology because it threatens your subjective sense of what you are. Okay, but you're still saying these kids should like, not be accepted because they don't really fit in either place? They can't just like... I'm saying that the Boy Scouts have a standard. You must be a biological boy to be a Boy Scout. You have to be a boy to be a Boy Scout. That written, though? In the name one? Boy Scouts. <laughs> because, because, it, because, this is, because this is a, a very... Okay, for, because for all of human history, boy meant boy and girl meant girl. Boy did not mean girl. And girl. And if I call you a moose, are you suddenly a moose? Okay, if I redefine our terms. No, it's a, yes, that's right. Men and women are a completely different thing. This is true. Have you ever met a man or a woman? They're completely different. It's not a thing. It's genders. It's not saying you're Okay, why, why is that? I don't understand. Why? Okay, let me ask you this. How, uh, okay, I won't ask you how old. I will ask you how old you are, okay? Because you're young enough that it's probably not insulting to ask you. So, I'm 22, so I'm probably only naive, right? No, why aren't you 60? Why aren't you 60? <laughs> and why, why can't you identify as 60? Why, what, what is the problem with you identifying as 60? <laughs> You're right. Age is significantly less important than gender. You can't magically change your gender. You can't magically change your sex. You can't magically change your age.